leads to my other question. We chatted a little bit about it um, kind of off camera the other day, but um, I want some of the theming of, of us with these interviews is collecting. Um, right. So I, I know we already talked about it, but for the viewers at home, what's your sword collection, Sonny? <laughs> your personal I, sword I have collection. A, I have an extensive sword collection. Yeah. And if you want to see it, you go to Valiant, dash armory.com and you open up the craftsman collection and you click on any one of them that's yeah. my collection uh i don't i don't have i don't own a single suit yeah uh i like designing them i like making them and i like sending them to their new home uh i've made swords for my kids i have five kids uh and and they like them and i enjoy them uh but I I don't feel the need to uh, to have individual ones. I mean, I think that actually would be cool. I would one day like to be able to take the time, but I don't have time to build myself a sword. Yeah. Uh, and I really don't want to own a sword to somebody else. Uh, so uh, eventually, I, I feel like I, I might do that. But I think I told you it's kind of like the. Uh, the mechanic's car always needs to be worked on, but he doesn't have time to work on it. Or the yeah. plumber's pipes, he's got to call another guy to fix his because he's too busy at work fixing other people's pipes. So it's it's kind of a little bit of that. But uh, oh, uh, I love them, though. Yeah. And every every sword that I make, there's, there's a great deal amount of uh, love that's poured into those. And, you know, uh, we, we've sent out stuff where, you know, maybe we, we, we missed something and, and uh, there may be uh, a little bit of a quality control issue that needs to be uh, uh, addressed. But we've always honored that. I've always taken care of customers. Uh, I've never left a customer holding the bag on something. It's important to me that all of our products meet the expectations of our customers and i will go out of my way to make sure they will now that you know uh you're with cult of athena so you deal with the retail end of uh uh this business and you deal with customers and there are some people you know you can't make them happy yeah it's it's just not gonna happen yep but uh as long as i've been contacted and yeah. i'm made aware that there's an issue uh, I've always gone out of my way to try to make things right. And, uh, you know, as, as long as that, that's the end result, then I, I, I'm pretty proud of it because I've always uh, stood behind the work that we do in the past. Great. Um, yeah. So I was, I was really curious about, I'm always curious to know like how, um, especially someone who's dedicated, who's devoted to the craftsmanship of sword making and all that, like, you know, why specifically and all that. Um, it's funny, you and Ryan, I interviewed Ryan before you and he uh, said the same thing about Excalibur too, <laughs> about growing up watching it and like that being a big influence. And he's like, I don't know, this is just who I am. <laughs> this is just what I do. And like, as I think the most simple answers with that, like they're the most transparent, honestly. Um, Let's see. Let's talk about um, if you're cool with talking about like uh, we kind of talked about obviously the origins of Valiant and like how you got into it and like your devotion to your craft and everything. Um, talk about your other than your own research and your own experience of making blades and like from these other um, people that you had to clean up work over time. Um, talk about your main influences as far as like from sword making, um, including yourself, obviously, like your experience and like how that kind of came through. And then maybe some some other people that you uh, you've worked with that have influenced your craft. And you mentioned like Christian Fletcher before. Have you you've worked with him, obviously. Right. You said you've got Albion Scabbards in there. Or you, am I am I not correct in saying that? No, not Albion Scabbards. No, you got you uh, got no, go ahead. Uh, I couldn't hear you. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. I'm probably talking over you. Uh, no, Christian would design. Uh, he designed like the first scabbards for okay. our signature line. And, you know, 
basically the overall uh, swords themselves. He designed them on Gus Trim, Angus Trim blades. Okay. So, no, I've not done anything with uh, any Albion blades or, cool. or anything like that. Now, we make an awful lot of uh, scabbards uh, aftermarket for Albions. Okay. So, I've wondering. handled tons of Albions. I mean, right. I, I've got an Albion sitting right over here that we just made a scabbard for for a customer. Nice. Uh, but, you know, as far as uh, the influence, uh, to me, I think I was extremely fortunate. You know, I'm basically a newbie going on the forums looking for advice. And the first blade maker I got in contact with was Angus Trim. Wow. And, you know. Raw, huh? absolutely i mean it's like uh i mean it's like wanting to study electricity and the first guy that you you, you meet is tesla you know right it's like okay here you go like, i'll help you i'll like, tell you fun. everything you want to know it's, yeah uh i i don't know I, I i know there's a lot of guys out there who are i guess looked at as i don't even you know the 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 gurus you know, the, the masters or, or, you know, there's a lot of different terminology. And Gus doesn't forge. He does stock removal, which is what I do. And, but I don't know that there's a person in the modern era of uh, sword making and sword uh, manufacture that has had as much influence on the overall uh, way that swords are made and looked at and the, the dynamic properties and the balance as Gus Trim. Uh, I, I'm very fortunate uh, to have established a relationship with him. Uh, like I said, we first started talking in, in uh, 2007 and we've been friends ever since. Uh, I, I Lately here, I, I think I talked to Gus almost every day. You know, we, we, we've done different uh, things in the past. He's obviously, he designed the blades for uh, the first several swords uh, that we produced when we really tried to improve the line. Back then we had a, a practical line, which was all Gus's designs. And then obviously he did the blades on the, uh, the signature uh, designs. Uh, the first ones anyway, Christian uh, design, but I, I learned more from studying the properties of uh, Gus Trim blades than from any other source. Uh, you can look, uh, you know, there's all kinds of books that are out there that uh, Oakshot has put out, Records of the Medieval Sword and Swords in the Age of Chivalry. There's a lot of, of uh, materials that you can gather, information that will really be helpful if you want to be a sword maker. And obviously, I don't have a lot of uh, uh, access to museum swords like uh, all the lucky sword makers in Europe. Uh, right. You know, you, you glean information where you can. And I, I don't think anyone has influenced the way our blades are made more than Gus Trim. And luckily he's a friend. And uh, so, you know, he he's often uh, commented on different things that, that we're doing. And, you know, we give feedback and back and forth and then I get shipped a Gus Trim blade quite regularly for a scabbard, you know, yeah. so it, it's a pretty standard fare. Uh, I just shipped out to a couple of days ago, you know, but uh, as far as the sword world and understanding the proper form and geometry of a sword, uh, as far as an influence, it's, it's Angus Trim, Gus Trim, the old dog. Is that's that what he's called? Him. That's his, that's his, uh, so he's like the, so he's the main influence, you would say, of, I think you called him the Godfather before, right? The Godfather. Oh, yeah. of, no, that's, that's, that is it. That's what I was looking at. That's the word. Yeah. He's the Godfather of the modern sword world. Uh, as far as, as performance, I, I, you know, if you look at cutting competitions where people go out and actually, you know, use the swords and 
uh, cut to Tommy or water bottles or whatever, you know, uh, media they're wanting to use uh, to show the, the sword actually perform. I think most of the competitors, uh, or at least the ones that are having success are using some uh, various gust trim sword. You know, yeah. uh, they, those things are like steel laser beams. <laughs> it's very, I mean, I've cut with a, with a handful of his, of his items over the years when I've done cut testing and I'm like, even some of the ones that he's done that are more what we would call like a price point item or like a mid range item for cult of Athena. Like, I'm like, damn, the balance on this is really good. <laughs> it's just like, you feel it's so like, it's so alive in your hand. I could say the same thing for Valiant too, because of all the work that, I haven't really cut a whole lot with with your guys stuff but like you feel it it's very it's almost like it has a heartbeat in a way right. you know from the engineering point of view of it well you know if you look at, at, at different swords and i believe me like i said I, I get a lot of them in here uh i mean even from individual makers swords that sell for three thousand dollars and more yeah actually I've got three of those in here right now. Yeah, that, uh, that I'm making, and you know, it, those swords or the Albions or whatever, they they all have a different look uh, to them, and and you can see the craftsmanship that goes in them. But I've found that when I want to really judge a sword. Uh, one of the best ways is to have your eyes close when you're holding that sword. And it, 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 it shuts off the visual influence of it. Mm -hmm. And it allows you to understand and allows the sword to reveal its true self to you to where you know what this sword is about. Balance wise, you can feel it, yeah. you know, and, and you just, some swords, have that it and others don't no matter how pretty they are and uh that that's that's the the one thing that i'm striving towards and our swords are, are vastly uh improved the swords that we make today are so much better than a year ago and so much more better than two years ago three years ago and i think that's what uh, the goal is that's what we strive for is to constantly improve our product, our craftsmanship, uh, till it gets to a level that, uh, I mean, I don't know that you can ever find your finish point, uh, but there is a point of diminishing returns, you know, where you put so much effort into it and there is no discernible difference. And so I'm trying to find that, that balance point to where I'm happy. I'm pleased with what's going out. And so is the customer, and the price point's right. And uh, that's our goal. And I think we're getting there and, and we're, we're trying really hard to get there. But, you know, you always want to improve. And uh, I mean, I can't say, too much about it but along that line uh gus and i are doing a collaboration really that, that uh it's it's kind of on the top secret side now gus and i have discussed it and uh uh i told him that we're going to be doing this interview ahead of time and he's like yeah you can mention it but let's kind of keep most of it under our hats for a little bit uh but it it is going to be a next level thing okay. for Valiant Armory and for, for Gus. And uh, we're hoping that at least that little project will, will turn into something that, uh, I don't know, it gives another option for people out there. You always, you always want to have different levels of, of product for, for the different levels in the market. They don't just make Mercedes. They don't just make Chevy and Palace. Sure. You know? there, there's a full gambit 
uh, that you run uh, for for the different uh, sword levels. And uh, Gus and I talked about it for quite some time before we uh, finally decided on on the approach that that we wanted to do. And so we're going to try to fill one of those niches. Cool. So that's going to be something, obviously, like him being the engineering part of it, um, not like you're not, but like he, him being the engineering part of like how how much he's been influenced in the sword making over the years. Like, um, I guess I well, mean, you guys have been you guys have been. For, go ahead. I was going to say, I, I told you this before uh, when we talked before the actual interview. Uh, the analogy is that uh, if we were using cars, is that Gus makes race car engines. And anyone who's ever handled a sword sort of knows. It's like the thing I said, close your eyes and hold the sword and it's magic. And I hope Gus doesn't get upset with me, but his swords are not always the most pretty little works of art yeah. they they outperform everything uh uh I, I gus puts so much effort into his stuff i'm not picking on his stuff but i want to take the gus trim sword race car engine and i want to put that package in a valiant armory package which is a little prettier. Sure. I like to think. I don't want to toot my own horn or whatever. Uh, yeah, you should or, be proud of your work. You guys do great stuff over there. Uh, so. But we do we do great leather work. Uh, Design-wise, I, I think we make some beautiful swords. Uh, we try to do the balance. We, we want them to perform, and, and we want them to be aesthetically appealing. And then, obviously, we do the, the full package you know, we're doing uh, wooden cores and hand dyed, hand leather wrapped scabbards and handmade belts and the whole nine yards. But, you know, we want to take all of that and we want to just drop that race engine right into it. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's like taking a shortcut, you know, in, in any job that you would be an apprentice and a journeyman and you work your way up and you're trying to get to master level it's like cheating yeah <laughs> it's like it's like, uh, it's like getting to master level you know skip i'm gonna skip this last 10 years and yeah. i'm gonna go ahead and jump right in here uh but it, it allows uh a way for us to offer something that I think would be well appreciated in the sword world. And it also it allows uh, the Gus trim or the Angus trim, uh, just all of his works to, uh, I guess, to extend, you know, Gus told me he wants to have a legacy uh, that he doesn't want you know, Angus trim blades to just cease to exist when he decides he's made his last sword. Yeah. And, you know, I'm a little younger than Gus. My son's a lot younger than me. Yeah. And, um, you know, Gus is a true friend. I, I, uh, I, I'd like to help in that. Yeah. You know, so, so basically that's it. There, there's more to it, obviously, a lot more. Sure. Uh, that, that That's a little planning. hint of like what's going to be coming up between you guys, the top secret yes. um, mission as it is. Yeah. Uh, well, when we're, when we're ready to kind of make the announcement, uh, Gus is going to visit me here in Texas. And uh, maybe we'll invite you down and you guys can do a video and maybe document what we're going to do. So. Yeah, I think that would be a great idea. That'd be awesome. I mean, it seems something that you both are really excited about with that coming up. And I know you can only say so much right now, but um, hey, if, you, if you've been, if you've known Gus as long as you have, 
Um, why do you, th and this is, this is me knowing that you guys have known each other for years. Like he's a, he's, he's a, like, he's got an engineering mind like you do. So like when you guys are talking together every day, you guys are mostly talking about swords and like, I know like probably like just catching up and everything too. But like, what do you like when you guys are looking at designing stuff, when you guys are looking at like improvements, like how he, the, he still gives you insight into like, um projects you're even doing now through valiant uh or is well, he like what how does that how does that relationship work because like I, I haven't gotten him on here yet but um just from what your your friendship with him your relationship with him you know we, we talk we talk a lot about uh you know different models of sort over the years and you know he'll check in and you know see what's going on with me and he'll tell me what's going on with him and more so before recently before we decided to i guess uh start this other little project and you know i'm not even sure what the whole scope of this project would be so you know i i, I don't want to have people speculating too much but i mean you do want to have it somewhat of a tease but as far as our conversations we talk about the sword market in general the general state of of where it is and uh where we think the trends are uh you know when gus would make swords years ago he told me that uh you know he had to make a sword that you could take the blade uh and you could cut deep into half inch plywood and yeah. it had to be able to withstand but the blade geometry that goes into that type of design is completely different from what people want nowadays hmm. and the the trends and uh what the market is wanting nowadays lends itself more to the over sharp i'll even say i mean swords were sharp a lot of people think swords weren't sharp back in the day they were sharp of course but what they are now i mean they're making these things like razors yeah and, uh there's youtube videos of guys showing you how to use three thousand grit sandpaper it's a step-by-step -step process and how to make these blades so sharp that you can shave hair, uh, you know, or whatever on them. And that is done to make the cuts that they're wanting to do easier. They're cutting water bottles, they're cutting tatami. And so the blade geometry that you want for that is completely different because I'm not sure you want to take an edge that refined and shove it into the half inch plywood. <laughs> No, no, that's going to get, that's going to, you're wearing away a material, I would imagine. So like what? Well, one of the things that these sharpened edges also allow for is, and I, I might make some people a little angry at me and I, I don't want, I'm not, I don't want to disparage anyone, sure. but I think it helps cover for maybe uh, a little bit of lacking in technique yeah. when doing cuts. Uh, if the blade is incredibly sharp and your alignment's a little off or you know the draw or, or, or any of the other techniques you would use to, to uh, make a cut, I just think it's a lot easier to get through yeah. that process with an over sharp blade and so i think that's why the trend is there uh yeah. it's it's like in sports you know uh i've coached i have five kids i've been coaching baseball since 1994 okay you know and my youngest just turned 13 yesterday so i've been coaching a lot of years and it's the same thing is true with these kids you know they I'll go get $300 baseball bats to get an extra uh, 50 foot of pop on the bat. Yeah. You know, instead of working on their swing, mechanics of their swing, mm -hmm. and all of the foundational building 
techniques that you would need in order to improve your swing to where you can get that distance uh, on your own without the $300 bat. And I think a lot of that is the same with the sports. And, but, you know, that's the market. So we, we gear ourselves to that. I've changed the geometry on my blade to accommodate that in a lot of ways. I, I know Gus has. Uh, and I'm sure others have. Uh, but, you know, whether we were doing it or not, uh, I, I think the customers, the end result, the potential owners, if that's what they want, they're going to get them there anyway. Yeah. Um, they, there's so many more people doing patients on their own of, of uh, the products that we and other companies produce. And it, the, the, the niche that is the sort is much more versatile now than even you know, five years ago, even that much more uh, than 10 years ago. Uh, and and it, when, when I first got into it, uh, what are we at? We're, we're going on uh, 14 years, something like that. It's, it's improved so much that I think that whether or not we catered to it, they would get it there, but I think it's in our interest as manufacturers to listen to our market, listen to, you know, what what they want. And so we try to accommodate that. So we'll always evolve. Yeah. I mean, that's the beauty of swords is if swords didn't evolve, we wouldn't have so many different types. Right. You know, go, go back to, to the Bronze Age swords and all the way through the Roman, the migration period, you know, Everything evolves over time. Yeah. Now I, I had this one thing that it, it would be really funny if we were able to go back in time and find out if we were wrong. Yeah. About what swords, because you know, a lot of assumptions about swords are based on finds. And you know, we found a lot of swords, and there are a lot of swords in collections and museums. But what if the majority of them didn't survive? And it, it's, it's, I liken it to way, way in the future, you know, the very few cars that survived, what if there were the ones that we just made the most of, like the Ford Taurus? And right. everybody assumed that back then everybody must have drove, driven a, a Ford Taurus because they made, you know, three trillion of them. Yeah. And it's like, Back then, we don't really know. I, I think this is my personal opinion. Sure. And the the the, the Oakshot typology, and then the, the other uh, ages, Peterson, and uh, for for different sword types. I love those as a as a roadmap. I've never tried to stay perfectly uh, faithful to those because I've always believed more in the the. I guess philosophy of uh, historically plausible than historically accurate. Okay. Because uh, historically accurate is is we found a museum piece and this is how they made them, and we actually found multiple, so we know a lot of people made them this way. So that means yes, I can produce a sword that's like that. I can be historically accurate, but then I'm locked in. Right. I'm, I'm limited if I right. want to follow that guideline. How long? That. I like to think, okay, if I was the swordsmith back in that time, what would I want to make? Would I only make my patriots and contemporaries are making? Or would I want to experiment? Would I want to try to improve the craft? Would I be the cutting edge guy that was developing new uh, styles of swords? And so I think in the modern sword world i think the same thing is true so i i like to experiment now i do think there's great value in having the typology uh and following that and because you know you are making and producing something that could have been held and used during that time period right so that's that's awesome 
Yeah. That's fun. And that ends a, a, an energy to the sword itself. And I appreciate that. But in the same way, I like to go out, you know, the uh, beaten path a little bit. And so I, I like both. Yeah. We kind of see that a whole lot through the history. I mean, the history of swords anyway. It's like even between the, the swords and the scabbards between you and I here, even, even across these other companies is like, it is a piece of history. I mean, it is like, what was, what was hyper-specific to that area, to that culture? What did they need? I mean, something that was used on horseback is going to look so different than something like an arming sword that you'd be on foot with. So that engineering had to be there anyway. So like, I, I definitely see that with the, um, rather than just going to that more like, like linear mold of it, like this is exactly it. There's plenty of people doing that already with like sure. medieval reproductions and stuff like that. But it's like, we have, we have modern mathematics and technology and like, honestly, ingenuity of like people like you and like, and like Gus, it, it should be integrated into the sword making because that's going to, that's going to progress it forward into not just the next trend, but also like the preservation of the skill set. I would think. Yeah, I think so. Because, you know, there's not a lot of people out there that are teaching this. I mean, uh, when, when you go to some of these areas, uh, there's, there's, there are companies and they hire, you know, people, they train them how to do what they do. And then some of those offshoot and they become individual makers. Uh, uh, I, they have like a tree where yeah. it, it shoots down somewhat, but they may also be more in a closer proximity to other makers so they can get together, they can share uh, information, techniques, and they can hand that down. Uh, when I started, uh, th there was no other real medieval sword makers in the area. So I gleaned what I could on the, uh, on the internet and with my conversations with Gus and Christian and you know a, a, a couple other people. I mean, I did a, a project with John Lindemo and uh, I guess the warder uh, that we did way back when. But other than that, I had no personal interaction where someone was standing at a grinder or whatever right next to me saying, this is how I do it. And uh, so, you know, you, you kind of take the basic information, you know where you want to go because you know how you want uh, the blade or the guard or the pommel or whatever to end up. So, you know, there's the destination. Yeah. But the path that you take to get there is, is probably a little different than someone who has been doing it this way and now you're standing next to them. They're going to teach you all the, the processes. And a funny thing about that is, is that when I was first trying to, uh, to teach myself early on, years ago, trying to uh, grind blades to, you know, uh, the, the first iterations of in-house made Valiant Armory Swords, I'd practice on steel. And I'd, I'd seen a very few videos of people grinding and i i'd always seen them going from tip to tang down well, the i wanted to get i wanted to get to this yeah coming this way and so they're kind of you know doing that motion uh and i was going through you know practicing that and i remember uh gus telling me you know uh when you're when i first got my grinders he says you know be careful you know, this thing's moving quick. Uh, it'll grab it'll grab a blade. And before you know it, it's out of your hands and it is gone where it wants to go. And so that automatically kind of instilled a little bit of fear in me. I was a little paranoid about that. Uh, and then uh, I had heard some uh, other stories. There was a, a famous knife maker who was polishing a, a knife on a, a buffer, a high-speed buffer. And he, I guess, got the tip caught up in it and it threw it right and it, it killed him. Yeah. I pushed it right into his heart. And I, so I had a, a fear of that. 
So yeah. I'm trying to teach myself all these techniques. So I turned my grinder around and I started grinding backwards. Okay. And I started grinding on the top of the blade. I don't know. It, People will probably look at me like, this guy's an idiot. But <laughs> I, so instead of grinding tip to tang, I grind tang to tip. I grind on top of the wheel. I grind with the, the belt spinning away from me. I use gravity to hold it in place so that I can focus on uh, the, the actual debris of the bevel. And so, because I, you know, I was, focusing so hard on keeping it the proper pressure up to the wheel and uh, you know the the degree of turn because you know when you look at a a, a properly uh, profile tapered and distal tapered blade like a medieval sword you know it starts out in this you know direction then it rotates as you go near the tip but then it turns back and goes in the other direction we don't have just a, a single turn, you know. There's right. a lot of complex geometries, and it also depends on uh, if it's a, a linear distal taper or, you know, if it's a nonlinear where it, you know, takes a draw, a plunge, and then it's it's a lot less uh, radical uh, taper, and then it maybe increases. And th there's a lot of different geometries that go into doing the sword. And personally, for me, I found it was a lot easier for me to uh, pay attention to the, the, the very minute details of that geometry. If all I had to do was focus on angle and I didn't have to worry so much about keeping it in contact. And then I could apply the proper pressure. And then you just learn to grind from feel yeah. rather than visually. I mean, of course, you're always watching what you're doing. But I can feel the angle uh, of a blade that I'm grinding much better than I can actually see when you're looking down, especially I'm old. I wear these are basically trifocals, these progressive lenses. I've okay. got three different prescriptions. And the funny thing is, is that uh, since I started wearing these glasses, I no longer even see straight lines. Yeah. Every line I see is kind of a curve, a parabolic mm. curve. And so often, I mean, I know what a blade's supposed to look like and you kind of, your brain compensates. It's remarkable uh, how, how, uh, how much our brain can do when we're dealing with visual things. But if there's something that I, I know I need to see exactly the way it needs to be, I'll go drag my son in. Yeah. <laughs> look at this, does this look right? Does, 